Yep, they're right. They should be good to go. Everybody remember to turn on your microphones. They are voice activated, so you can just leave them on during the entire meeting. All right, I guess we will call this meeting of the Moorhead Economic Development Authority to order. Uh, Amy, roll call first. Thank you, Mr. Um, chair. Acting, acting chair. <laughs> acting chair. <laughs> uh, members present today include Violet Delkey, Wyatt Johnson, Pat Kovash, John Rogala, Jeff Schauman, and Bobby Soline. Six. All right. Uh, any amendments? Oh, and Wyatt, I'm just going to start here. I just wanted to make sure that um, one, we first welcome Jeff to the the EDA as a, as a new member, but um, and, and I'd like to to give him a moment just to introduce himself and and kind of his background. But I also wanted to to make sure that we thank Charlie Johnson, who's in attendance today, and uh, for his service on the EDA. He had um, termed out with the number of terms that he was on, so it's just a uh, fantastic run that uh, his service and his efforts for the the EDA. So I just want to make sure that we thank Charlie and uh, and we're glad that he's here. So uh, with that, maybe thank Jeff, you, if uh, if you want to maybe just introduce yourself before we get going too. Sure, uh, Jeff Schauman. I uh, believe I'm an at-large member on the board. I've uh, been a Moorhead resident for. 16, 17 years. I was back then the city planner of Moorhead. I uh, worked for uh, RD Offit Company doing real estate for them for 10 years. In the last five years, I've, uh, I've been a uh, principal in a construction company that does commercial and multifamily projects kind of across the country. So glad to be here. Uh, I'm looking forward to getting to know all of you a little better. Yeah, welcome. Thank you. Welcome. welcome. Thanks, Jeff. All right, thanks, Derek. Uh, any other amendments to the agenda? If not, we will look at last meeting's minutes from January, I guess. Uh, move, I would entertain a motion to approve the minutes from January. So moved. Second. All right, uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? All right. <clears throat> Uh, citizens addressing the board, uh, anybody not on the agenda that would like to address the EDA today? I'm not making any eye contact out there, so I'm assuming that's a no. <laughs> we shall move on to commissioner's reports. Which commissioners would like to report in today? Pat? I'll give you a brief report here from the MBA. Uh, the MBA would also like to thank Charlie very much for his uh, service and he's been a very active member of the MBA and thank you Charlie you, you've done a great job um, we're gonna have uh, March 16th we're gonna be involved in the St. Patrick's Day Parade uh, March 26th we're gonna have uh, uh, our diversity job fair and it's from 10 to noon at the Moorhead Center Mall last year we had 38 businesses that participated in it and this is for anybody that's looking for work so it, it gets very well attended uh, we have a lot of people I mean we definitely have uh, employment issues it's tough to find good employees so um, on May 23rd we're gonna have our annual golf tournament at the Meadows Golf Course we've already got uh, about half of the number of players that we had last year I think we're gonna have a really good turnout on that and that's a really fun event we're hopefully, I know we have one of our holes is going to have a hole in one where you can win a pontoon and we may even have one where you can win a vehicle. So that's going to be fun. And then um, July 4th, we're going to have our 4th of July celebration and we're going to do something new this year for those. We had a lot of people that wanted us to have food there. So we are going to have some uh, food trucks from six to nine. Uh, Post-traumatic funk plays at eight and the fireworks will start at uh, 1025 so and that's kind of a really neat thing that's uh, that's kind of part of Moorhead's identity and it's just uh, great to be a part of it good thanks Pat others um, we lost our mall manager here in the Moorhead Center Mall Christina and in, we have just hired a new gentleman um, his name is Andrew Nielsen and he'll start in three weeks Good. 
All right, seeing no other commissioners stepping forward, we will move on to Derek's economic development report. Thank you, um, Acting Chair. I'll just go through a few uh, different things on the report. You'll notice that starts on uh, agenda item number six and page four in your packet. A um, couple different things to note. Um, well, I'll first start with the downtown master plan. Um, we, as you may have all know, we, we've been starting that process of trying to hire a third party consultant to uh, kind of kick off this downtown master plan. We had just a, a tremendous uh, turnout with uh, submissions. We had 13 different firms um, submit. Uh, each of those proposals were anywhere between uh, 30 to 75 pages of, of all their qualifications. It was just fantastic. All of them were extremely well done. I had conversations personally with with uh, a 10 of the groups that submitted. A lot of them that we focused on, we wanted to make sure they had a local tie. Uh, and, and we've seen that with the majority of the proposals that came in, that they did have a local uh, tie with some type of planning or engineering firm, communication firm in town. So we're really excited with what we have. Uh, we um, had a great review committee that kind of had a, a lot of different uh, pieces to it. We had. Michael Burns, who obviously represents this Economic Development Authority uh, and is on my board, uh, Dave Anderson, Marsha Bluchinski, Ted Haran, uh, Dan, and, and Christy with uh, the city of, Moore, of Moorhead. So we had a great team that really did a, a wonderful job reviewing those proposals. It certainly took a lot of time to go through the 13 of them, um, but we are um, excited to be moving forward. We, we shortlisted uh, five, five different groups that we're going to have in for interviews next week which we're hoping by the end of this month for sure, if not right after the interviews, we'll have a recommendation on a firm to move forward with. Uh, a lot of them are eager to start and uh, just really excited with the turnout and really excited to, to, to start it. So, um, And feel free to stop me at any times if you have questions on anything on the report. Uh, the second thing that I really wanted to focus on was uh, the City Council Economic Development Workshop. As a part of the new, um, kind of newly elected council members and, and newly elected mayor, um, city manager Chris Volkers wanted to um, have an economic development workshop, summit if you want to call it, and just kind of give them a download, a brief kind of economic development download of, of what we have for policies, what's kind of happening in our community, uh, but really kind of focus on what their questions were for us, what they've been hearing. A lot of them went door to door, obviously, as a part of their their election process, uh, try to answer any questions they have. I want to thank uh, Amy because uh, Amy had to, to put a lot uh, together for that. We ended up, it kind of came together very, very quickly, uh, but we had a stack of probably about 150 pages. I mean, that packet was about yay big of all the policies and all the economic tools that we can offer locally, regionally, and as a state. Um, well, and we actually had national because we had the opportunity zones in there too so from the federal government. So we had an extensive amount of uh, material that we we distributed to uh, the city council members. Uh, if we haven't sent that to you folks, I know it's a really big file. We're going to try to get you that as well because it's it's a lot, um, but I think it's important information for you to to see. Um, and uh, this is a really good conversation with folks. Obviously, trying to, everybody's trying to better our community. Everybody's trying to stimulate our economy, make sure that we have a, a successful. Um, community, so the conversation that definitely needed to be had, had but um, I foresee more conversations with the council coming forward just because it was a lot of information to go over. We had them for about an hour and 15 minutes uh, but right before council meeting, so you can imagine that much material in about an hour's time. Um, there's also, and maybe um, uh, Dan Molly can get into this a little bit, but there is a city roots planning session, which basically is a, a spinoff of the city's uh, strategic kind of planning session. This is kind of separate from the downtown plan, but the city is undergoing an, an initiative to really rebrand and, and kind of focus on the strengths and assets that we have as a community here in Moorhead, which I think is... Um, really uh, first class work that needs to be done because we need to identify ourselves with something. We need to be able to easily explain what our assets are here in this in this community so we can sell our community. Um, so that was on Wednesday, March 6th. There was a, a group that came in, met with a lot of the city department heads, uh, city leadership team, and really trying to come in with uh, 
some branding ideas, and I think there'll be more to come out of that meeting too. And Dan, I don't know if you want to mention anything from that session. Well, yeah, absolutely. The um, so this is we try to uncover our foundational elements of who Moorhead is. It's a little different than what normal marketing is, where there's a big, large reveal of a strategy and that sort of thing. But it happens with conversations and surveys and things like that. I think you've already been drawn in with a survey that went out, and so we're talking about. We got this kind of root session, the kind of the framework for this thing, kind of together with uh, the city mayor, city council, and, st and st staff. And so there's going to be, um, in a couple weeks, a convening of the groups of these first findings, and we're laying out next steps of what this identity initiative looks like, which is a key part of the uh, the Morehead strategic plan that you'll we'll be talking about a lot more in the coming year as well. Any questions so far? Um, I also had an opportunity to meet uh, with the Greater Fargo-Moorhead EDC on a couple different occasions this past month, and, and one of them, um, the Greater Fargo-Moorhead EDC just hired their new Chief of Business uh, Development Officer. His name is Ryan Ashheim. Uh, he came from JLG Architects uh, out of the Fargo office. Um, really youthful, kind of brings a lot of energy over there. Had a, a, a great conversation with him. I, I, as I've mentioned to this group in the past, I think we really have an opportunity to, to kind of reset the relationship with the EDC, but also really be a factor to them and, and make sure that they understand what we have for policies as well. I actually met with Ryan the, the day that we were meeting with the council for the economic development workshop, and I brought one of the packets, and I said, if you want to help us, read this. <laughs> um, and uh, and I, as far as I know so far, he's been going through it. He's, he's asked me a few different questions on some things. Um, they have what's called like a, a kind of a, it's a little booklet that they hand out to primary sector businesses that explains all the different incentives, whether it's from Moorhead, uh, Cass County, Clay County, Fargo, West Fargo, you name it. They have kind of a booklet and a lot of that information that they had from a previous, um, previous production was incorrect information from Moorhead's perspective. So we felt that it was crucial to meet with them, get that stuff updated as they are kind of out and supposed to be selling our community as well. So great conversation. I think there'll be more to come with that. I, you know, a few different things that uh, that I want to make you aware of too and, and things that uh, uh, I, I want to make sure that you're engaged with is there's a, a corridor study that's, that's starting um, just kind of in its early onsets, they did have a public engagement meeting a couple weeks ago, but it's the U.S. Highway 1075 corridor. So we're looking at um, Main Avenue from basically the, the river here uh, going out towards Dilworth. Um, that kind of stretch of Highway 10, they're looking at, at kind of some improvements. This would be a project that's like still about five years out, but they're looking for a lot of public input of what this section should look like. Um, from the 75 perspective, they're looking at uh, Maine and 8th going south to the interstate, so our college campuses, all that kind of business that's just south of, of uh, Maine Avenue and 8th. Um, there's going to be lots of opportunities for, for public engagement. I want to make sure that um, uh, you're well aware of it. We'll try to share those, those uh, open houses uh, to folks. There's some focus groups that are being establishes, established within those areas. Um, I've, I've kind of stressed it from the beginning, but I think it is important for, for economic development to really have a seat at the table in these studies because the way we design our infrastructure certainly impacts our future of what we can do from, from a business perspective, how we can accommodate businesses, but also um, how we service our existing businesses too. So a um, lot of opportunities there. Uh, had my opportunity to, to the, for the first time, go to uh, West Central Initiative's first economic uh, development professionals meeting. They hold a quarterly meeting. This was in uh, Detroit Lakes, and it was uh, this past uh, Wednesday. A great opportunity to kind of connect with our, our local and regional economic developers within the region, um, but also connect with our, our uh, Department of Employment and Economic Development representative, David Heyer. So we'll continue to, um, uh, to, to attend those events in the future. Two different events that uh, have happened or are upcoming. Uh, the Red River Market, they had their first ever indoor market in the Moorhead side on February 9th. We talk again about, you know, why is this crucial to economic development? They brought in over 3,000 people into our downtown. Uh, that directly impacted some of the businesses. I, I know I've, I've talked to a couple different folks with the restaurants in the mall. Um, huge turnouts and huge numbers there, so they're, they're grateful. 
uh, we're excited to, to announce that they're considering another indoor farmers market. Actually, they've they've announced it. I think on Facebook now. Um, on Saturday, March 30th, they'll have another indoor market at the Moorhead Center Mall. We're still uh, working out some details with them, but excited that they're bringing these type of events and really engaging our our um, our, our our residents. They get a mix of kind of everyone, families to college to um, you know all sorts of folks, which is just fantastic. We need more things like that. Um, Pat mentioned the St. Patrick's Day Parade. This was uh, quite the ordeal of trying to, to save this thing. Um, it all kind of started with uh, the group that had done it for a number of years, uh, looking to kind of maybe take a, a step back from this year, uh, try to kind of regroup. They had some other commitments. Uh, Mayor Tim Mahoney in Fargo uh, made a statement right away that he wanted to save it. He was working with the Fargo Downtown Community Partnership. Um, fast forward a, a week later, I get a call from the Fargo Downtown Community Partnership that they were looking to save it and then incorporate it into the Moorhead side. And then it was kind of all hands on deck at that point in time, really working closely with the city, some of the business owners, et cetera. Um, and we're, we're excited to see another kind of event, another uh, kind of cross collaboration, collaboration uh, event uh, that we'll see a, a parade, another event within our downtown community and really just another event for our, our community in general, which is fantastic. So um, for those of you that don't know, some more things will get launched here publicly, but um, they, they were thinking about doing a similar route to the Holiday Lights Parade. Um, we felt that it was important just from a staging perspective and some of the closures that happen at, at 8th and, and Center Avenue that really are kind of crucial uh, choke, choke points for our, our community. Um, we're going to have a lot of the staging on the north side of the Moorhead Center Mall. And we're going to try to get some more activation at the mall as well. So kind of have a nice gathering point for a lot of the, the volunteers. Uh, we see the majority of, of people at the Holiday Lights Parade attend kind of that section. They're in that kind of uh, densely packed area of, uh, of 8th to the river. Um, so we're excited to, to try to get a lot of families. Hopefully it's a nice day. Hopefully it's... Uh, um, obviously, we've been all feeling the effects of the, the winter here the last six weeks, but uh, hopefully it's a great day. But I know in the past, even on, on colder days, days, they've had great turnout. Um, they'll have a, 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 race, a race before the event, a running race before the event that'll kind of run that route. So, um, again, another opportunity to engage our, our folks and, and hopefully bring people, more people into our, our community that we're, we're trying to grow here. Yeah, the 5 and the 10K race is actually starting from the mall. So there will be all those folks. And depending on what the weather's like, um, it's the Lake Agassiz Pacers' largest race day. And they could, it attracts anywhere from 500 to upwards of 1,000 runners. And then, of course, all their families come out and, and, the, and the like. So it starts and finishes in the mall. So the awards and recognitions will be happening there. So it should be a pretty active spot that morning, that Saturday morning. Um, I think 9.30 is when lineups and gathering starts and the, the parade oh, kicks off at 11. 11 a.m., yep. Yeah, they did a little bit soon, like earlier this year. I think, you know, in the past and some of my experience when I was in Fargo, the, some of the pub crawls uh, that were a separate organization, kind of separate uh, entity that was doing a lot of that stuff, uh, they were starting earlier and earlier, and that was some of the concerns with safety and some, you know, some public intoxication, unfortunately. And uh, um, but they're trying to kind of start it earlier to make sure it is a little bit more family friendly and and really focus on the intent of making it a good time for for all. Uh, I do have one more thing that I wanted to to note, and this is on the the last uh, portion of your packet. You'll notice. Um, there were no city uh, council projects that were had public hearings this past month, but um, we do have some upcoming projects. One is that we'll be, be discussing today on the 4th Street lot, but also um, there's uh, an office building being built for village uh, family services, and this is um, one that I've been kind of working on behind the scenes for for a number of months. They actually were uh, were going to be moving to Fargo. They they had a you know, building already secured. Um, and we were trying to I was trying to get them to to stay in, in Moorhead. Um, they had something fall through with the, the the building itself, where it kind of got swooped out and somebody bought it from underneath them. Uh, and I acted quickly and got on the phone and um, happy to say that the Goldmark Group is building a, a building for them just north of the Azul uh, strip mall down in South Moorhead. Uh, it'll be a, 
uh, kind of a, a, a office building dedicated for village uh, family services. Um, obviously, they do a lot of counseling, a lot of different things, uh, but they will be coming forward with a uh, an incentive through our new commercial industrial property tax exemption policy. Um, so, be excited to to share that. As we all uh, should know uh, and recall, that type of project. Uh, the commercial industrial, there's no real criteria. It's based on assessed property. So that one, we notice uh, yourselves as EDA members, but it does uh, just go to council for approval or denial at that point. So uh, they'll be going forward on the March 25th agenda, looking to break ground this spring as soon as they can. So excited to still see them involved and, and active and uh, still a part of our community. With that, be certainly glad to answer any questions you may have or any comments. Yeah, Violet. Well, I Back to the parade, um, what time of the day will that be? Uh, so the, the staging itself will start at um, 9.30 in the morning. And you know, for, for your purposes, Violet, just for an understanding, I'll, I'll be certainly able to, to share with you a map or something. But um, they're looking at the portion that's just uh, north of the United Sugars lot. So they'll be kind of staging in that area there. Mm -hmm. um, access will still be able to get from, from forth. So you'll still be able to kind of get back and forth out of there. Um, but everybody will kind of come in that way. Uh, thank you to Wells Fargo too. By the way, they've they've been gracious enough to open up their parking lot, so we're able to use their parking lot for staging. So the parade, yeah, we'll we'll stage there at 9:30. The parade uh, will start at 11 from that kind of portion of Seventh, Seventh and and uh, Center, and kind of come out and go across the river. And um, who are you working with? Were you working with Christina? Yeah, I was actually I uh, been uh, having a lot of conversations with Patrick. Uh, yeah. VC with the mall. Yep. So Patrick and I have been having conversations. I've told him as soon as he knew who the new mall manager was, you know, and I asked him who else I should be contacting. He just said to go through him at the time. Yeah. Uh, I want to note too that this isn't like our project. This is uh, sponsored and being ran by the Downtown Fargo Community Partnership. Yes. Um, so they submit all the applications and everything else. So they haven't made a whole lot of public pushes because I think the uh, street application permit just got approved on Friday last week. Um, so we're having a coordination meeting. Just want to make sure we get all the logistics, but certainly we can have somebody come in and and uh, awesome. and send you some information. Thank you. Don't be shy. Let's ask some questions. Well, the one thing that I really want to make certain is that um, that we, as a city, Moorhead, look good. That it's organized, um, and as far as the mall is concerned that that looks good and um, that the kickoff is good, that it's well run, um, because it will be very reflective upon us if it's kicked off in Moorhead. You know, if it doesn't go good, you know, we'll get the, we'll take the hit. Yeah, one thing that we've talked about too is, um, you know, in the, in the past, even for the, for the Holiday Lights Parade, you know, that area right now between 8th and 11th, yeah. I mean, just quite frankly, isn't that, active i mean we're starting to get more projects there we have some businesses there but they're not what you typically call like active uses right yes. with like restaurants and other things like that um so we're trying to maybe see since it's a morning event maybe you know some of the restaurants will open earlier or uh, is somebody willing to kind of set up maybe a, a coffee stand of some sort you know just trying to get some activity and really kind of embrace the uh the public too the hot chocolate. You know, originally we were trying to tie the Red River Market, you know, all those activities in with the parade kickoff because that usually runs from you know ten to one, you know, right over with it all of it. Would be really cool if we it could just get didn't like a little work out. But they, you know, I mean, the nice thing is, is they made another weekend in March work out. But um, oh. you know, Derek's exactly right. I mean, if there are opportunities for hot chocolate and coffee and people enjoying the experience of the space, I think mm -hmm. that'll mm -hmm. really lift up the. We sense. should really work on that, and I would be happy to work on that with you too a little bit. I yeah. just want to make certain that the kickoff is really good. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, we can certainly, I can, um, there's an event coordinator at the um, Downtown Community Partnership. Yes. And I'll make sure that we connect. Yes, yes, okay. Definitely. Other questions or discussion? Just a quick question. Uh, the day at the Capitol, any 
upcoming legislative changes that would result in either challenges or opportunities for us as a border community? Yeah, and I, this you know this packet was put out before. I actually uh, I wasn't able to attend due to some weather issues uh, that were going on. Um, we have been um, very closely monitoring a lot of legislative activity that's happening. Uh, one thing that um, uh, has been going on is we're trying to get sustained appropriations for our border city legislation. This is um, you know kind of two separate parts, as we we all may recall. You have one that is the uh, the kind of buy down of the commercial tax rate. So the tax rate is is uh, the same here in, in Moorhead as it is in North Dakota. That is in the governor's budget, and that has already been kind of gone through and approved. Um, the other portion is uh, basically an appropriation for um, kind of local authority, but also some local dollars to kind of put towards local incentives. So our workers' comp rebate program, uh, some other things. That right now, I mean, we've had to be cautious, I think, in the past just because we don't know if that money is going to be there all the time. Um, so with some of the um, the placements of um, some of our, our local representatives and senators being in strategic kind of committees on the taxing committee and others, I think our, our legislative um, lobbyists as well as um, Lisa Bodie and, and others here at City Hall that kind of focus on the legislative items are really thinking this is a, a great opportunity for us to try to get that sustained appropriation. Um, that's one thing that is uh, is really challenging. I'll just kind of say this in generalities of when we're out trying to attract different businesses and developers into our community and they, they understand that or they get the understanding of what that kind of appropriation means. A lot of them are saying they're, they're almost hesitant to, to start or to do something because they know that that could change at any time and that cost is going to be back on, on them. So they're either if they have an apartment building, if they have you know, something else, they're going to have to offset that cost somehow, whether that's raising rents and, and office tenants or apartments. or um, it's, a, it's a really difficult situation. So having that would be a really uh, big step forward for, for our community and for the other border city communities as well. You know, if I could add, there was some testimony in the Senate last week around border cities. <coughs> Sounds like it was a good conversation. Um, there's a real awareness that the issue really is along the Minnesota North Dakota border, maybe not so much on Wisconsin side and some of the others, but that there is a need for attention here. And um, what I'm wondering is at the next, in the April meeting, maybe perhaps we can have an update on um, what's going on legislatively. Um, and uh, here where we're at with the governor's budget and, yeah, and the like. helpful. Yeah, so we'll include that. And I believe, um, before I forget too, I believe the governor is actually going to be in uh, town tomorrow. Um, or somebody from the DOT, from the commissioner's office, that are talking about the 11th Street underpass in downtown. Um, I know for a fact the governor is going to be at M State on Wednesday morning to talk about some of the budget stuff as well. So. Um, be on the lookout for those. I think both of them will be kind of public opportunities to engage if you want. Well, the other thing now, did I hear um, that Minnesota is talking about really raising um, gas tax? And, you know, is there anything that, that we can do about that situation that will kill our gas stations? Yeah, it's, um, I mean, we're following a lot of different things closely. I think there's there's opportunity. I mean, we, we I should state that, you know, Dan, myself, Amy, we're, we're not the ones on the forefront of the legislative issues. We, we obviously are following things, but uh, Lisa Bodie, uh, who's the government affairs, um, as well as the, the consultants that are on, on staff for the, the legislative lobby and are kind of the ones that really will kind of say to us, hey, like, you may need to have some testimony or we may need to have somebody in in St. Paul to, to testify and, and really try to, to state what this means for our region. Um, so we're really following a lot of things closely. We're just kind of waiting for the, hey, we need you type of thing or this is what, you, what we need. Um, I know I provided a few different things uh, for that testimony that we did last week for the Border City stuff. Uh, I've been working with Sherry Larson with the MBA on, on different things, too, if we need things from the MBA. Um, th it's a community-wide effort, right? So I think if we do need to even engage the EDA at some point, I think that's something that we should we should certainly all consider because yes. it affects all of us. Yes. Well, and, and to Ms. Delke's point, uh, I think that's part of the reason for asking about border city legislation. Is there an opportunity, if the gas tax goes through, that border city can be broadened as a long-term legislative effort? 
that we can do more about all the taxing implications, not purely those that relate to property tax or, or employment taxes and things of that nature? Yeah, I think it's a it's a really good question. Um, I'll be the first to admit there's still a lot of stuff with the legislative issue, uh, legis border city legislation that it's it's difficult to read through and know what kind of authority you have. Um, but that's why we have some experts on it too, and we're trying to get some uh, some local stance on it to make sure that we can try to capture some of that or add to it. Um, I know there's been um, concern in the past of asking too much because of. Detroit Lakes, Alexandria, Fergus Falls, other communities that are nearby that don't have that same uh, authority that we have. Um, so I know there's been some restraint, if I want to call it, of, of maybe asking for a lot. Um, but we certainly have to yeah. be asking the right things for our community, too. Thank you. Derek, is, isn't there something in our border, am I mistaken, but isn't there something in our border legislation already that helps protect us from gas increases from the tax increases i i don't recall i don't know if i'm looking at amy i, I see amy shaking her head i i don't recall the understanding that there actually was that if there was a cap in there i'll make how much higher we could be and could we look into that yeah, yeah i absolutely. thought there was yeah absolutely we'll look into it and we can certainly send out a an email to the board if we find something or report back on it at the next meeting too. Hey, good discussions. Anything else? John? Just an old business here. In August, we received a letter from a developer. Um, haven't heard an update recently. If you could, maybe next month, or if you have information as far as where that sits. Yeah. We're approaching a year and. Mm should have been addressed by now. Yeah, and I'll uh, I'll state that that I haven't been involved with any of those conversations. I know City Manager Chris Volkers and, and uh, City Attorney John Shockley have, have kind of been there. I think maybe, Charlie, you might have been at the last meeting that they had all together a number of months back with Jordahl. Yes. Um, the last one I heard was that John Shockley was going to be uh, looking at some things that we might be able to do uh, and that he was going to bring it back. So. Why don't we do that? We'll, we'll follow up, yeah. Maybe Dan will we'll talk with, with Chris and John on that. I know we want to get it resolved as, as much as anything. I've, I've had some conversations with uh, Jordahl's group on separate items as far as uh, some development on the, the western uh, side of, of 8th Avenue um, or 8th Street. And, and um, yeah, we want to move past it. Well, and that's my concern is I, I'm hearing that there is interest but I don't know if there's going to be anything moving until we resolve these questions that's been sitting out there for some correct. time. Yep, correct. All right. Looks like that's it. Thanks, Derek. Yep. Thank you. Uh, next up, I guess we will call Brian Konovsky up to the table to join us for a review of the mm -hmm. Renaissance Zone application from Epic Companies. For mixed use project located at One Fourth Street South. <clears throat> yeah, and, and I think Dan is going to kick it off first well, if yeah. you want. Well, I, you know, I wanted to share that you know, Chris, City Manager Chris Volkers had intended to be here. She wanted me to to, to send her apologies. She was stuck on a flight, um, probably somewhere between Denver and here at this point. Um, so, uh, so you just have us. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you know, I just uh, you know, before we kick off, I just want, really wanted to lift up the amount of energy um, that's happening around the downtown um, there's been it's been really clear that um, you know over the last couple of years that that Moorhead is working hard to be a development friendly place um, and that um, you know that really speaks to the effort of this economic development authority and the and the city council over the last few years and so I mean as I go through uh, you know my mind as I was kind of getting some thoughts together last night you know I'm thinking of the Simonson warehouse the Wright building Block E the former American Legion building Cafe Soul Harold's junk junkyards expansion the former armory the 913 apartments we got a Kovach project in there Buchholz's apartments I mean this is we're already over 10 um, that are currently underway or happening and so uh, that's a movement <laughs> and I just wanted to, to start by saying thank you for all your efforts to make that happen that's that's not easy to either catch a wave or you got to create a wave whatever it is 
um, you know, you know, it's happening. And so this is a, a pretty exciting project here that's kind of in its infancy. Um, uh, just wanted to let you know that the city uh, council has been pretty clear on its intent to sell the property. Um, an access agreement has been approved as soon as um, uh, title is transferred from Burlington Northern uh, that uh, the developer could get in and start doing some soil bearing and things like that. And we're looking at, a, at the application for the Renaissance Zone exemption today. Uh, and um, so with that, yeah. I'll, I'll turn it over. Yeah, and, and to Dan's point, too, I mean, we got a lot of great things happening in downtown, but we also have a lot of great things kind of moving and shaking throughout our community as well. We've had a really great conversation with the majority property owner on East 10, um, which was, uh, I think, a really good step in the right direction with some different things, as well as, like, again, we mentioned the Village uh, Family Health Service. I mean, that thing just came together, like, within a matter of, of days they had the application at our desk and I think that shows the willingness of city staff and others to really be accommodating to to growth and 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 being there when they need it and how we make them successful so uh, with that um, I'll, I'll kind of give a, a brief rundown of kind of history the application itself um, Brian's here as obviously a project representative he'll be able to kind of answer more specific questions to the, the building itself the project itself um, but I'll kind of walk through everything first and kind of make sure as we have some newer members here of just some of the history and timeline. So I'd really um, kind of put your focus towards maybe page six and seven of, uh, of your packet and uh, um, item, agenda item number seven. And, and so really if we kind of push back, you know, I, I started um, kind of gearing up on almost a year now um, with Downtown Moorhead Inc. And as I was kind of going through and, and looking through our downtown, I really just try to do a, just a personal assessment of just what we had and, and what opportunities are out there. And one that just stood out to me were just the amount of parking lots we had was one. Um, and I saw all that progression that uh, Kevin Bartram did with his uh, Kassenborg kind of lot and moving, moving north. And then it just stopped at the railroad. And I've always wondered why, why didn't it kind of move uh, one step further to the north in that parking lot. And... Um, as we kind of uncovered some different things um, and some more development interest was starting to happen, um, you know, I just kind of asked the question kind of point blank to some city staff, and it was, um, well, we have, uh, we'll have to do some digging on it, but um, here we found out that over 40 years ago, the, the city paid the, the railroad uh, for that lot, uh, and there's a payment receipt of the, the railroad cashing, cashing that check, and title never got transferred. And that was in like 1973, 76, back in that time frame. So we're talking about a long time ago. Um, and, and certainly there's some constraints on that lot itself with some different flooding things. But, um, you know, a simple, if we don't ask, we won't get. So we kind of rekindled that, that uh, ask again. I uh, have to give uh, credit where credit's due, and I think Chris Volkers did a good job of, of establishing a good, strong relationship with the railroad that sometimes isn't easy. I uh, was able to make some progression, and, and, um, and you know, kind of now before you have a project that is, is real. Um, it's a real project with uh, uh, a real consideration that the railroad, railroad will be handling, handing over that title within a matter of days, if not you know, maybe a week or so. So we're, we're very close. Um, uh, and I'm glad that we're progressing with some different things. You know, just um, kind of looking at the, the timeline of how we're getting to this point in time here, um, obviously had some conversations with Epic a, a number of, of months back uh, and a lot of other development companies. Epic seemed to be the most serious at the time about, you know, what happens if we were to bring a project forward to the city on this lot? Um, what would the city's response be? Uh, at that point in time, there was uh, an executive session on November 26, 2018, uh, with the city council, uh, and that was to discuss the, the land sale itself. And we kind of laid down a lot of different options, whether that was um, going through a um, identified kind of RFP, request for proposals process, uh, a, a notice process, or are we even willing to sell at this point in time? Uh, and the direction from the council at that point in time was we are wanting to sell a lot of the land that we feel is developable properties. Uh, at that point in time, that triggered a, a notice, which is in your packet. It's at the, the end of your packet. Um, just kind of hold it up here so you can see it. This is kind of the, the notice that you'll see. And 
and that notice was made on, on December 20th of 2018. And what it said was, we're really kind of seeking a mixed use. It's, it's different than what you'd normally see in a, a standardized proposal where it just says, here's the parcel number, we're selling this lot. We had a specific kind of ask in here that we were uh, looking for a mixed use property. We we're seeking uh, the right for um, getting requests for proposals, so getting proposals. Uh, offers would be considered until January 16th of 2019. We wanted it to be, you know, workable proposal, construct high quality mixed use building, architectural character located on Prime River lot, other amenities engaging, celebrating the river, and meets the vision and goals of our, our Moorhead Renaissance Home um, plan. So that was kind of the notice itself. That notice closed on uh, January 16th, 2019. We received one um, submittal, uh, and I should note that, you know, we did send that out to a lot of the different development groups that I had worked with. I had conversations with groups, uh, but we did get the one submittal and that was from uh, the Epic companies. And that proposal, that submittal that you will see is, is attached to your packet as well. Um, with that, the kind of next step was um, on d d uh, January 28th, 2019, there was another executive session and this was, uh, I, and I should note too, in the previous executive session, uh, we were obviously going through an election period, right? So we had our, our previous council mayor, but there was also the newly elected in the room. Uh, they, were, they were asked to just be in the room so they could understand what was going on. Um, on that January 28th, 2019, uh, we had another executive commission with, the, uh, with the, the new council, and that was to kind of go over what the proposal was getting their direction if we are willing to proceed with it. And at that case, um, council had directed that we they would like us to proceed. So that kind of brings us to this application. And I'm just going to kind of refer back to a few highlights. So um, obviously, Brian's here. He knows the project uh, through and through. But uh, some of the highlights is they're looking to construct a new five-story mixed-use building with underground parking. The, the project name is, is Bolig, uh, which is Norwegian for residence or, or housing. Uh, the first level uh, would be commercial. Levels two through five are residential. Obviously, um, at this point in time, as and it's not uncommon with most development projects, uh, there's no tenants named at this point. But after city approval and breaking ground, uh, the the developers will be working to secure tenants. Um, you know, Epic states they 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 see this building as an iconic building that pays respect to the Scandinavian heritage that overlooks the the Red River. Uh, and views of, of Moorhead. You'll see a kind of a, a building square foot, floor by floor. Um, in the application itself, through the Renaissance Zone, the developer is asked to kind of really do a lot of the due diligence of, of showing how they meet their goals and objectives. So you'll see that. I don't want to go through that word for word, but you'll see how they meet a lot of it. But you know, some highlights that I want to see, or want to add is, you know, they're adding more housing to our downtown, which we created that that housing goal of 500 units over the next five years. We need more people to support our existing businesses before we can even think about um, adding a whole lot of new stuff uh, or standalone new stuff. Um, this is a, an entryway into our downtown, whether it's exiting or entering our, our downtown community from Fargo or from others. Um, so this is um, uh, an entry point for us that, again, has sat really as an underutilized vacant um, parking lot for, for a long time. We're infilling an underutilized parking lot for higher land use. We're creating an active uh, space with ground floor uses, uh, adding more attractive uses to our downtown, including some of the, the riverfront amenities. Uh, the project at its current state fits within the, the local um, zoning district. Um, so that provides a, for a mix of commercial and residential uses. Uh, one thing to note, too, within that uh, zoning district, there are no parking minimums. Uh, that is something that the city had done a number of years back. We want to, we, we understand that within urban environments, it's, it's we're talking about smaller parcels. Uh, we can add different amenities. I, I think we have a lot of other parking around, but um, um, there is no parking minimums associated with, with projects. Um, that's something I want to stress on, too, is that we've been working very closely with engineering, planning, part of the Center Avenue project, but also looking at the 4th Street lot to add more on-street parking in front of this building to not only service their project, but also service the other businesses around it as well. Um, now we'll kind of get in the meat of it, which is the financial considerations. And um, again, this goes right off of our new Renaissance Zone um, 
policy and plan. The total project cost that includes land is $8.25 million. Um, the way we do the calculations for determining the term is we take the, the square footage of the building. We're talking about the usable square footage of the building. So in the policy itself, we exclude parking areas. We talk about uh, usable commercial spaces, livable uh, residential spaces. So we exclude the basement uh, parking, but we also um, exclude our land costs. So it's, we're talking about improvements to the uh, property as well as um, kind of some of the soft costs with construction management, architectural fees, et cetera. So the, the kind of fee, uh, the way that cost per square footage is broken down is about eight, a little over eight million divided by 4, 44,595 square feet, which equates to approximately $180 a square foot. Our minimum threshold for, for the 15 year exemption uh, is $175 a square foot. Again, this is, um, these are, I mean, we don't have a project yet. There's a, a process of tracking that throughout the project. Uh, that's something that myself will be working very closely with Epic on to make sure what they say is what they do. Um, and so we'll be, we'll be following that very closely. But uh, they are uh, eligible for a 15-year property tax exemption. Uh, again, a few things to note. The land value remains taxable throughout the, the duration of the project. A um, couple other things to note is based on our new exemption scale, we have the first five years are 100% exempt, excluding the land value. So the, the, the improvements are 100% exempt. Then years six through 10 are at 75% exempt. So the city will start seeing a 25% kickback on the building improvements. And then years 11 through 15, we'll see a 50% exemption. So 50% of that project um, improvement will be taxable that the city will start seeing value. So again, as we've discussed for a, a, a number of, of months now is really how we're tailoring our exemptions is we want to, to help stabilize the project. We want to get the project to be able to cash flow, make money, stand, stand alone, and then we can kind of start kind of pulling back a little bit. So that's why you see that kind of breakdown of the, of the term percentages. Um, you know, again, traditionally you see, depending on the scale of the projects, anywhere between three to six years of um, kind of that stabilization pro uh, uh, time period for projects. Um, timeline, if, uh, if approved, uh, construction would be, be begin this year um, of 2019. So as soon as kind of they're able to get in, Dan mentioned there's the site access agreement. There's a lot of due diligence that has to go on there. You'll see in um, kind of this handout, the, the red bolded line that kind of goes along the western edge, that is the floodway. Uh, so no, no uh, building materials, no construction can occur to the west side of that. They are inside the flood plain, um, but there's certain um, standards that they have to build through. They're well aware of it. We've been working with engineering. So there's a lot of things that they just need to get on the site, work through, um, make sure they have kind of all their due diligence done. Uh, what we'd be seeking is obviously a recommendation from this EDA board to the city council. Right now that would be looking at the March 25th um, city council meeting where they would ultimately approve, deny the incentive as well as uh, developers agreement, purchase agreement, things like that. But today we're just looking at the recommendation for the incentive piece. So with that, that's a lot of information. I'm sorry I had to go through, but this is obviously the first one we've seen from the Renaissance Zone application. Wanted to make sure everybody understood it um, and, and certainly want to be able to answer any questions. But if you have any project specific ones or Brian, if you have anything else to add that I missed, feel free to, to interject and we can move forward. Hi, I'm Brian Konofsky from Epic Companies and uh, thanks for your time today. Um, Derek has gone through the, the basically the layout, I think, is, as well as I could. So I'm just here to answer any specific questions that any of you guys have uh, that I can help with. I mean, Derek, I guess you hit on a couple of the concerns as I had read through it on flood and parking. I, you know, the flood thing, I, clearly that's being handled by the experts. The parking is still concerning to me because the, the 23 spots for 45 new residential, you know, uh, 
it, to me, that seems thin and it doesn't look like there's much room outside currently, but it, it sounds like other things are being looked at for that. Yeah, other things are being looked at. I mean, obviously the, the site is, um, I mean, just the layout itself where the buildable space is, is a little bit limited. So they've, they've tried to accommodate as much as they could. They may be able to accommodate some more on site in some of the, the outside exterior places. Um, we'll kind of work through that, but certainly um, with some of the improvements happening on Center Avenue, I mean, even just, I mean, you look at this photo that um, this first kind of layout, you have a large kind of right turn lane mm -hmm. that kind of protrudes out that, I mean, Dan, Dan and I have done the measurements. I mean, this, this roadway section is 60 feet wide, just directly to the south of that, where we're just talking directly to the south of the tracks between like, um, um, well, you have like the black frame and, and the insurance company, that's a 30 foot wide section. So we're almost double the size not even, you know, railroad track splits it. So there's ways to look at that roadway differently. Um, we certainly want to be working closely with all the surrounding property owners. Um, this is something that I think we're going to continue to work through. I mean, I wish I would have had the, the, the map here, but we can show the abundance of parking around this area. This is a cultural thing, and, and uh, uh, it's, it's a hard thing to break. Um, but in, in the long term of what we're trying to do for our community is to build density, to build value to our community. Um, if we have to create safer pedestrian kind of crossings or safer kind of pedestrians, uh, pedestrian ways, biking ways, whatever it may be, I think there's opportunities to utilize the, the lot that's uh, right outside of the former Herberger space or the parking ramp itself uh, that's covered. Um, one advantage that I think we we have at this point in time is th there is no charge for parking. Um, we don't we don't as a city or community charge for parking, so there is free parking in a lot of areas. Um, but certainly, as a part of this project, and, and Epic has made that clear too, for for to accommodate the the large amount of commercial f um, space on the first floor. Uh, we do need to look at trying to accommodate some more on-street parking. We'll see some more uh, added on to Center Avenue as well. So there's more coming, but we we want to get creative with it as well. Yeah, good. I'd, I'd hate to set those businesses up to fail right away. But everything yep. else about it looks just fantastic. I think. Yep. Yeah, it is. A, it's, it's a concern for us, too, so we're absolutely looking at everything we can. Good. Violet? So the parking spaces that are in there, are they designated for um, the, the tenants or? The underground yeah. would be yes. For the okay. tenants, for the residential tenants. So, are there any parking spaces within this spot? Just, just what you see right, uh, right as you get by the ramp there, um, where the ramp right is coming here. down. There's a couple uh, handicap spots, and then across on the other side. And then, as we're working with, working through, you know, this is a early, early concept. So we haven't really yeah. massaged this site that much yet. And until we know really where we're sitting at with the railroad and where we can be parking over there and, and that type of thing, we should be able to gain some more spots outside that way also. And I'll note, just to kind of add on to that, so as a part of when we're, we've been working closely with the railroad on just the kind of transfer of title, uh, they have asked for kind of an access agreement along that, that southern portion of the lot. Um, that's not uncommon of what you see throughout our, our downtown or throughout you know anywhere really around the railroad tracks. Um, a lot of those areas are used as access and parking. So again, as Brian said, as they kind of go through approvals, yes. um, once once the city gets ownership of the lot, I think that's kind of held up some things too. It was just they want to make sure the city can own it and actually sell it. Um, they'll really kind of dive into to see if they can kind of um, incorporate some more things. It's been one thing that we've been discussing for a number of months now. And what's the timeline then, if you're able to start this year, when would you anticipate finishing? Uh, if, we, if, if we get everything rocking and rolling, you know, we're looking at an 18 month build. So if we're in June and July, then it'd be next the fall after. You know, I think, you know, one thing to, to kind of point out too is obviously next year is a, a big year for, for some construction projects in our downtown. We have the Center Avenue project that's going under, under construction. Um, there's some railroad um, track improvements at 4th and 5th. Um, and then this project. So again, looking at the long term of minimal disruption to a lot of our, our businesses long term, I think this kind of fits fairly well with some things. We certainly have to get creative with timelines of how that 
uh, is accommodated with MPS and the city's uh, schedule of the construction, but uh, everybody has been very open-minded and, and um, very considerate of, of what we have going on. Awesome. Uh, yeah, first of all, thank you, Brian and Epic, uh, for your interest in investing in downtown as a real estate developer and contractor. Appreciate the numbers and, and uh, studies that go into making an investment, so thank you first and foremost. Um, just a couple technical things and then maybe some broader questions for you. Uh, so if, given you're in the infancy stage of development, have, has there been any discussion about for example, the balcony intrusion into the floodway, is that something like parking that you look to address as you continue your site planning efforts? So we've had, like where you see that hanging over, very minimal discussion on that. It was more so uh, coming up to that back wall. Uh, at, in, apparently in some places in town you need to have like a 15-foot berm before you start your, your uh, build. Um, in this area, we have gotten to the point where we won't need that. We can build right up to that as long as we floodproof that basement, you know, engineered floodproof. The the hanging over of the balcony is a different. That's a different animal. I I don't know the answer to that. But, but, but you're uh, aware of the yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I'm I'm hoping that they say well as long as you're above you know 44 feet, right. go ahead and hang out there as far as you want, because um, then it would be you know like a bridge you know the bridges are lower than that um and if we're at a 44 foot water crest or, or <laughs> nobody's nobody's looking real good at that particular time so can i i'll just add to that very quickly too so um as a part of this project as well there is a required conditional use permit through the planning commission process and then um there's also some um, outreach to the DNR, Minnesota DNR, as a part of it. Some of those conversations have already started between our engineering and planning firm, uh, planning uh, staff, and and the DNR. Um, you'll notice too, like even just the the bike path that's uh, that's kind of going down that sloping as well. You know, some of that um, that area we don't know if that could be built yet. They're, they may have to get creative on how we do that. But we're certainly, as a part of that CUP process, going to try to ask for everything. And maybe it can't get built right away, but we've been talking about flood protection in this community for a long, long time. You just never know how things change, and we want to make sure that it's, that it's in there and see if we can get something. Because we want connectivity. And same with the developer. I mean, they want connectivity to their site as well. Can, can you, Brian, maybe share with, with us for public information, have – has there been any thought to exterior treatment of the building? I mean, kind of the, the renderings we have are very massing-oriented kind of yeah. drawings. Uh, any color on what you envision the Scandinavian heritage looking like in right, the building? Right, right. I, I don't. Uh, I don't think we really have any preconceived notions. Obviously, we've got brick, and then architectural panels of some sort um, would be the the two main focus pieces uh, you know no residential type siding or anything like that so um that's about as far as we've gotten with that and and, and then just one last question mm -hmm. um and, and i'm new to the commission so i'm just here to ask questions and <laughs> and uh, uh one of the kind of key objectives and policies is creating this entryway and so given it's center avenue um Currently, your, your building configuration has the stair tower and elevator shaft right on center. And so perhaps as you go through this exercise of better defining what that site looks like, I mean, first and foremost, completely on board with, with the incentive to get the investment worthwhile for you, but understanding that that comes within the framework of the policies that we have to deal with. So like the one concern or question I would have is, you know, right now you've got glass panels showing. Don't know if that ends up being the same or not, but it's, it's going to be showing stairs, as I understand it. And is that really this key entry feature? Um, and I don't think it's about money. It's just about design, mm -hmm. right? And so um, I don't know what action's being looked for by the EDA today, but I mean, given that's the second point on our objectives here, I would just you know, ask that maybe some design consideration be given to, to that end of the building. Yeah, so I, I think I can speak to that uh, in other, other buildings that we've done. 
we have learned that sometimes, although it'd be easier to stick stairs on the end and just be done with it, sometimes it is nicer to kind of get them inside the building. It, it causes a little bit of, of, you know, design issues as far as floor plans, but you end up getting a, a corner unit, which is a little bit more desirable. A lot of times you get two glass, you know, two places to put windows, so you don't feel like you're just coming in from a hallway, looking straight through your, mm -hmm. straight through your unit out your patio, you know. And so, absolutely, that's uh, one of those things that we will be, we'll be looking at. And I, I can add, Jeff, just so you have an understanding of you know what we are looking for here today and how we can move forward. So, um, I mean, certainly you can recommend approval, recommend. Um, approval with conditions you can recommend denial I mean that's those are the th kind of three options you have one thing I want to, to note is that um, we are formalizing like an incentive agreement purchase agreement and a lot of those things we can incorporate within that policy instead of having it through just a an approval process um, you know we, we met before here with with uh, with Brian um, we've been working closely obviously with the city manager and and, and um, city attorney John Shockley so um, you know, if there are things that we should consider or look at, I think that's where we try to incorporate that language. And then I'll take it even a step further. You know, I, I'd like to move away from trying to do this like project by project in the future because not all projects are going to come in with incentives potentially either. Either so, as a part of that downtown planning process, we definitely want to make sure we're looking at our zoning code uh, and, and incorporating some key elements that we we get the design that we want as well through code not through negotiations as well but i just wanted to make that point that we're we're wanting to kind of get to a a more of a clear process for all people involved so it doesn't keep us open for public perception on that in that case john just to, um could are the residents are they tenants or are they going to be sold condos uh, as of right now we're leaning toward tenants okay all right um I was asked a question here is if you were going to look at selling those would you have an option to have something similar to what they did in Fargo in the Renaissance zones with the like the Ford building they had uh, had there was a, a significant benefit that they had for people buying into those units so yeah. uh, I don't know if that's been discussed or looked at yeah I'll touch on that so um, that was it this is where a key difference is between our Renaissance Zone versus North Dakota's is because it's a state-led uh, program in North Dakota, and where that incentive was for owners in in Fargo or West Fargo specifically was, as a tenant, you had the ability to get income tax exemptions on your own personal level that way. So it wasn't necessarily um, an incentive given locally; it was through the state through their income tax. Um, we don't have the ability to offer that here in the state of Minnesota. Um, I will note that that was challenged very strongly in North Dakota as of late because, well, quite frankly, we had people owning their second or third homes in downtown and were taking exemptions from that, incentives from that, uh, that were only really accommodating a certain <laughs> class. Um, as we were going through this process, um, the biggest key, and I, you know, I, I manage the program, Dan managed the program in North Dakota as well, or in Fargo specifically. The biggest uh, piece to trying to get development to happen was the, the local property tax. Um, unless, again, this ownership was driven towards a very targeted class, which I think we got to be really careful of. Yep. And we, we did bring up uh, ownership in this project. I just want to make that clear as well. But, you know, that's a challenge throughout all development right now is the, the condos and ownership of it. Um, a lot of project that, projects that we've seen, they want to have those pre-sold before they even go into it. Uh, so it takes a lot of legwork to even build up to that point. So we have discussed that. Again, I don't think Brian's ruling anything off the table, but at this point in time, I think what they're showing is is a, a rental apartment. <clears throat> Any other discussion? All right. Uh, it sounds like we need to potentially make a motion of some sort for recommendation or denial. I would, I would entertain 
motion of some sort. I would move that we approve the tax incentives without any conditions. I'll second that. All right. Uh, up those who in agreement? Well, can we have a discussion? Uh, yeah, discussion. Sorry, sorry. For, <laughs> further discussion? Yeah, if I could. Okay, Jeff. <laughs> uh, so again, I'm completely on board with the tax incentive provided it meets the goals that are set before us. I mean, we're talking no insignificant dollars here, but it's money we wouldn't have had, right, if not for the development. So completely on board with the 15-year as proposed or discussed by staff. I think what I want to be careful of and the reason I'd be leery of not putting any conditions on it is I think form's important in tying what we've started on, uh, I guess, Main Avenue into the Moorhead Center Mall. And I'd hate to have the back door staircase be that connecting element. So for me, it's really about what's an entryway look like. I don't need to be the person making that decision. I don't need to tell you what kind of flowers to plant in the, in the beds out front. But I think that's an important piece in making sure we're doing our job as, as a commission, quite frankly, to say, hey, money comes with certain standards. And I don't think those need to be uh, financial hardships on a developer. I just think it means, hey, let's work together. So I don't know if staff should do that. I certainly don't think a planning commission or a city council should do that. So I don't know who that is, but that would be my concern in just having a carte blanche approval of 15 years of tax incentives. Is, is that our job to set that? I thought, what, from my understanding, I, I was, I th thought how I heard it is that you're going to work through that with the developer as part of the contract? Yeah, well, I think there, there's That's kind why of, I said that, sure. Jeff, so yeah. I guess just so that you're clear. Yeah. There's kind of two folds here. I mean, one, I mean, we, we don't have like a, a design review committee or historical preservation committee that kind of does that type of stuff. Um, this board, I would give at least the expertise to if you want to see those um, Kind of standards considered at least uh, a direct staff, direct you know city manager and um, and others to kind of work with the developers to create uh, those kind of conditions. Um, as I mentioned before, I think we're at kind of a, a unique phase in that we have some uh, good kind of zoning standards, but we maybe don't have them all yet. So. Um, that where it does leave some discrepancies at this point in time. So if there is, again, I think you can have every right to have uh, a condition that says to work with the developer to, you know, to maybe. I mean, you could get a specific to try to move that staircase if you wanted to. But uh, I think we just have to be careful that we just want to make sure we're working closely with them so they. I mean, maybe they can't do it for whatever reasons too, as you are well aware of. Yeah. So, uh, Commissioner. Uh, Mr. Kovash, uh, I, the only reason I, I bring it up is if the city council is pushed by a resident and us in turn as their appointees uh, to say, hey, how did, how did we wisely spend our dollars, if you will, or our powers to, to waive taxes, I would have at least wanted to say, hey, we, we had them come back and show us the rendering. I don't think it's about the money at all. I, I just think it's about, hey, I, I want to make sure that there's not a bunch of party board on the end of the building with with no windows, right? I, if, you, if you understand my, my concern. So whether that recommendation be, you know, uh, we recommend approval subject to coming back or subject to a small group with staff. I, I'm not trying to create more work for anyone. I'm just trying to say that after it's built, people will ask questions about what the process was. And this can be an iconic building that adds to the downtown of Moorhead and let's make sure we do it right. You know, one other thing, because this is a, a new process for us all here, right? This is the first application that we've seen for the Renaissance Zone. Um, you know, as you read through their application, we have those specific goals and objectives. I don't want people to get, like, caught up on that. I mean, this, this is the kind of the end-all, be-all. I mean, it is still very subjective in a lot of ways, and, and that's not to be disrespectful to you, Jeff, at all. But um, I think even looking at the grand scheme of it when we're putting together, going from just like a, an underutilized surface parking lot to what it is there is, is a huge improvement. I don't think anybody can disagree with that, but there are certain components that we, we have to be conscious of. I, I would caution, and this is just my 
recommendation you know you can take it for what it is but i mean we do have kind of a, a timeline moving with this so coming back it could be difficult i don't know how much more they'll have at that point in time if that makes sense um you know i think we could we could pass along those those conditions we could work through it we can uh, make sh you know, we can incorporate that in the staff report or the council of communications and have that in there as well um but I mean, I'm open to suggestions. I'm just throwing it out there that we have to be conscious of the timeline too. You know, one thing that comes to my mind is that you know I'm thinking we're entering a downtown planning process. A lot of this, the standards, and mm -hmm. will will be part of that. Um, it's a little hard without the tool in the toolbox to yeah. to utilize it. So, you know. You know, I feel like you know uh, maybe you know what's being said here could be documented, and um, you know we have a recommendation on the table. I'm, it's it's a little hard to go back to the developer, and well, I should I, I, I let me let me put it this way. Let me let me let me put it this way. I mean, I, I hear I hear what you're saying, right? You know, and as staff, um, we have to be real cautious in that you know we're working with the tools that we have in this code. Isn't that right? And so, um, if if I can, just to help maybe get out of my own way a little bit, I'm new to the commission. I'm not here to put the the wrench into things here. I think the concern is that you could end up. No offense to the building, but if you look on Highway 75, Red Door uh, Apartments, if that had a retail component on the first floor, would that be the right building for here? I would argue it's not. Not that there's anything wrong with that building. Um, so I, I, here's what I would say. If, if the board wishes to just approve this without conditions, I'm not going to vote against it. I just might abstain because I'm, I'm new here. I think the challenge is with 12 members, if I abstain, it doesn't pass. That's the problem. Yep. That's the problem. So I, I want the building here. I just hope that we can add something that says that there's some review or approval of that elevation it doesn't need to be at a political level. Totally get that. Um, so let me maybe ask the developer, is there concerns with what I'm saying about having some comments on the end of that building pertaining to design? Well, you know, and I guess I would say I look at the end of that building with that Bolick sign and everything, I, I feel like it's pretty impressive, you know, yeah. as you're coming down, you coming down across uh, and seeing just another mixed-use building like I say we've done a lot of those and and having just the sides filled up with windows like an apartment building on top of a platform you know that will we know what that'll look like also so I, I don't um, like I said we're early on on these stages and things like that but um, to, to try and hide that uh, feature I, I would argue that the architect that uh, designed that would say that's that's a pretty cool thing. I, I think he would. I, and I don't know, I think you guys would have to look at that and everybody's going to make their own decision, but we certainly would follow uh, planning recommendations. I don't have a problem working with that, the planning department, and, and uh, trying to make these things work so everybody's as happy as we can make everybody. And, and you know, I mean, just in your defense, you know, I mean, I put up buildings too, and Derek and I, you know, we're, we're putting up a structure that's tin, and some people didn't like it either. And I just want to be sure that we're not, you know, I wouldn't appreciate it if somebody came in to my shop and told me what color of boats I had to order. And you know what, you guys have, you guys have really taken an interest in Moorhead. Your eighth and main building is beautiful. And I just really trust your judgment. And I, uh, you know, I just, I don't want to be in the way with anything because I just really have great confidence in Epic that you're going to do a great looking project there. Well, so Jeff, does that, does that answer your question? Did I respond? And, you know, I mean, I guess it's the big thing is, you know, it's just, uh, uh, we have no problem working with planning, that's for sure. Yeah. 
unless you there's know, further discussion. I'll go ahead, Dal. No, you know, one thing that comes to my mind is in the application. This is the first application, so let's you know this is okay. Yeah. <laughs> let's just do this. Yeah, you know, and this is this guides the future and the thing. But there was not a design review as part of the application process. You know, um, there's a recommendation related to the incentive. I guess that goes to the to the council, and that's the question before for the EDA today. We have a motion uh, uh, that's been seconded for uh, approval with no conditions. Um, and, uh, go ahead, John. Just a question. Yep. Here from. So with our approval, that's if it goes as stands, that would go to the council for their approval. It, do they approve it as exactly as what we have made the motion as, or they can make any additions or changes to at that time? I mean, so I mean, you're ultimately in this process of a recommending body, That's right? Correct. So your recommendation, whatever form it may be in, um, will be stated in the council communications of this is what the the authority has recommended. Um, the council would have the ultimate kind of approval authority of whether to accept your approval uh, or recommendations, whatever it may be, um, or deny it, or to add other stipulations like, you know, design aesthetic things or whatever it may be. So yeah, I mean, this this is the kind of recommend any authority in the council would have the authority. So with that being said, then is if we follow through on the motion, and then share Jeff's concerns here to staff and that they ensure that the there's the council wants to have a design review or whatever would be appropriate is it is that the normal process or should we make the recommendation to have that with our within our recommendation so I want to be real careful um, in how I, I say this but um, in, I mean, we're looking at, as an economic development review, we're looking at, I mean, the overall project, yes. Theoretically, they could come in with no images at all. And it could just be the contextual, this is what we're planning to build. And that's how it, I think it's been in a lot of cases as well. So I don't want, I, I, and again, I don't take this as disrespect at all. I, I mean, we've never really required even like this level of detail in a lot of different ways. Uh, this is the first renaissance zone incentive ever offered, correct? First renaissance zone ever offered, and the first time that we've had the EDA even review to this extent. Because in the past, really the only incentives this board would review would be TIF. Yes. Um, so this is a, a first process that we don't have, I'll be clear, I, and unless Amy can correct me, we don't have a, a design review committee. Um, if we did, I think we'd want to be very clear and objective of who's on that with uh, the type of people, uh, whether it's, you know, architects or, I mean, I'm not an architect. Um, you know, there's certain things that, that I have learned over time, too, but I'd want to make sure that we have a, a group of expertise on there that could provide that design element. Um, but the intent is not necessarily to uh, to get into that level of of uh, of detail within the projects. I think again, conditions can be made. We can work through it with a developer on it. But um, am I often saying some of that, Dan? Or I mean, yeah, I, it, you know, related to design review, we're into uh, an area that we have not been before, and so I mean, it's a fair question. But um, you know, we have an application at the yeah, table at the table. So let me, let me do this. I'm going to vote for it. Um, without conditions, I don't think it should go to city council with the caveat, hey, look at the design, because I don't think the city council should get into those details. But I would say going forward from a staff standpoint, I do think there should be some consideration for design when dollar incentives are attached to that. So maybe for the next project, we think about what that objective process might look like. And I'll, again, I, I just want to respectfully just say I, I would like to get to a point where it's handled through code. Fair enough. So it's not. Process. So then it's not because I mean this is no disrespect, disrespect to anybody here, but then it's not in our hands here as an EDA board. It's really, you know, our we can have design professionals look through it, incorporate you know four sided designs, the type of building materials, whatever it may be that we want to incorporate, and we're going to have experts that are part of this downtown plan that 
are going to in depth look at that. Um, but I, I don't want to get to a point where we're subjectively looking at things and 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 could create. I mean, either way, it can create maybe some uh, concerns in future dates. Um, but even for like the Red Door project, like that one, you know, I don't want to get too into the details on that one. But there was really no uh, code restricting that, right? If there was a code that maybe protected that neighborhood from it, we, we probably wouldn't even have a conversation with it. So I would rather see it all wrapped up, it's all <coughs> unified, everybody understands it, and it's not subjective to our opinions then. And, but I'm, if somebody disagrees with that, I, I'm totally, <laughs> I won't be. I think we should vote. I think so. And hearing no, no further discussion, I, we've got the motion to approve with no conditions. It was seconded. Uh, let's vote. All those in favor, please signify with aye. 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 Those opposed? I believe we got all. Motion passes. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you all. Appreciate Thank you it. so much. I believe that's the end of our agenda so we are adjourned thank you everyone thank you it is pretty exciting to see that that picture and imagine well,